God, you may be seated. You may be seated. Can we put our hands together for the best pastor and the best leaders in Arlington, Texas, Pastor Solomon Adair and First Lady Elizabeth? Come on, put our hands together. Let's let's show some appreciation for some of the best pastors and leaders, y'all. You don't understand the importance of good leadership until you haven't had it. And my brother and my sister, I've been rocking with them for years. We're talking over a decade, somewhere around 14 years I've known them. I've seen their personal growth. This man right here is my big brother. He corrects me when I need to be corrected. He edifies me. He speaks into my life. And I am who I am today partially because of that man right there and my sister. And I absolutely love you guys. It's an honor. It's a privilege to be back with ITL. Amen. How y'all been? Y'all been all right? Praise God. Praise God. I am excited today. I know uh, it's been a few weeks since I was with you guys, uh, and we talked about the many things, and we talked about Mary and Martha, and, and the one thing that was needed. We talked about uh, uh, Bethany being a certain village where certain people reside. And in that sermon, uh, God had showed us uh, that Bethany is most often translated as house of figs. And all I remember about figs as a child, I told you guys, is that we used to eat these, these delicious treats called fig news. And they had a nice little crunch on the inside. Uh, but but, but that, that, that word continued to linger with me day after day, week after week. And I said, what is it about figs? What is it about figs, God, that you have for, for us to be able to see in Scripture? What, what is the significance for your people? And I thank God that today, um, I believe God has a word for this house, and, and I believe that there's a reason why figs has continued to linger and linger in my mind. Amen. So can we put our hands together for the relentlessness and the faithfulness of Jesus? Praise God. As I mentioned, last time we were together, we talked a little bit about Bethany um, being uh, the, translated as the house of figs, right? And, and, and the significance of figs, meaning that it was always meant to represent as an indicator of the nation of Israel's well-being. And we talked about a certain village, a certain place for a certain people. The fig, the fig tree, and the fig leaf, y'all, it continued to plague my mind day in, day out. Uh, and as I began to look a little bit more into figs, y'all, the science alone could preach, y'all. Let me tell you something. It is amazing whenever cre creation testifies of the creator. It's amazing when we see his hidden glory in creation. Y'all, I started doing my research about figs, and what I found blew my mind. See, figs, figs can't be pollinated by just any species of wasp. This is, this is interesting. It takes a specific species of wasp to be able to pollinate a fig. And what's amazing is a fig, the flowers of the fig, are actually on the inside of the fig. And so in order for the fig wasp to pollinate the fig, it has to enter inside of the fig. And what you won't believe is that as a result of that fig wasp entering inside of the fig, what happens is it loses its wings. What's amazing is as that fig begins to pollinate each and every flower that's inside of the fig, what happens is it will have essentially exchanged its life because it's lost the ability to be able to leave losing its wings. It's exchanged its life for the immature fig to become mature. Y'all, that's not it. If that wasn't good enough, uh, I began to do some more research, and then I found out that figs aren't really fruit. Blew my mind. The whole time I thought figs were fruit, but in fact, figs are actually just inverted flowers. And what happens is when the fig wasp begins to pollinate the many flowers that are inside of the fig, each flower produces this single shell fruit, this crunchy item that when you bite into a fig or a fig newton, that crunch is essentially the fruit of the fig. So it's crazy because of this one sacrifice, not only fruit is born, but much fruit is born, y'all. And if that wasn't enough, my God. When I, I began to get excited because I said, God, you have this, this, this idea of the fig, the fig leaf, and the fig tree constantly rotating in my mind. What is the harvest season for figs? And it, and, and, and it amazed me that figs harvest season starts in the early summer and continues through the fall. Little did we know 
that God was preparing our hearts, preparing our minds for a harvest of figs. Y'all, this blew my mind because little did I know that God was seeking to accelerate the fruitfulness of his church. Y'all, we live in a time where the world is ever divided. Everyone is outraged. Everyone is mad about something. And at a time such as this, God is seeking for his church to begin to to, to display his fruitfulness, not just some fruit, much fruit, because of the sacrifice that gave its life for us to be able to bear fruit, y'all. I'm excited because I believe that God is in the process for this house and for the church at large. He's cultivating every seed that's established in and around the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I believe we're going to continuously see immature immature fruit becoming mature. A church unashamed, full of his spirit, not bearing some fruit, but much fruit, and fit for consumption for a desperate and starving world that doesn't even know what it is that they need. So ITL, before we get started, do me a favor. Look to your neighbor and say, this house is a house of figs. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your relentlessness after your heart people. God, we thank you that every mind and every heart has been prepared. We thank you, Father God, that we're able to come together with our eyes fixed on you and see your glory, God. We thank you and we ask that you remove every distraction, that you remove every distraction, everything that tries to exalt itself above your name on this Sunday, Father God. We pray that your word falls on good soil. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. So it should be no surprise that the title of today's sermon is House of Figs. Now, I have uh, four kids, as many of you know. uh, And let me just say really quickly as a caveat, ITL summer camp, let me tell you. You guys are absolutely amazing. With four kids ranging from ages two to nine, I was trying to figure out what we was going to do this summer for the kids. And when I say y'all came through in the clutch, ITL came through and all of my kids thoroughly enjoyed summer camp. So let's put our hands together for everyone that was able to provide, uh, everyone that was able uh, to serve. I want to say as somebody who benefited from it, God bless you and thank you. All right. But but having kids each has their own uh, things that they've taken to. And my nine year old, my oldest, my firstborn has taken to gardening. My father uh, has a green thumb. He's always had a green thumb and his father had a green thumb. My thumbs are just brown. OK, uh, it happens. Right. But 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 my son has taken to gardening. Uh, and so in our backyard right now, he has a garden and he's growing squash and he's growing jalapenos and tomatoes and green beans, purple beans, all types of beans. Uh, and, and in our backyard, what I've come to realize through his passion of gardening is anytime there's a harvest. Right. The, the process of cultivation is not just providing for but it's also about protecting from. Y'all, if I can just be fully transparent for a minute, uh, uh, I'm not scared of many things, but bees and wasps and hornets, if one flew across my face right now, I would probably forget what I came here to do today because I don't like bugs, particularly ones that bite or sting. And what I've learned is that with any harvest, cultivation is not just about providing for. It's also about protecting from. God has already established that that, that we are in a season of harvest where God is seeking to grow immature fruit to become mature. And it's important that in that process of transformation, in that process of growth, in that process of deeper intimacy with God, that we not only provide for the harvest, but that we protect from the enemies of the harvest. Because the enemies of the harvest, their one job is to uh, disrupt that process of immature fruit becoming mature. And I believe it's very, very important that as God is cultivating our hearts and minds, that we be aware of what those enemies are that seek to halt that process. Amen? Amen. So in our need to understand the enemies of the harvest, I want us to turn to Micah chapter 4, verses 1, and then we'll skip down to verses 4 and 5. That's Micah 4, verse 1. And if you need a minute, just say, hold up. One of the fruits of the Spirit is patience, I hear. So we're going to wait. 
Amen. And if you could stand for the reading of God's word. Amen. Micah 4, verse 1. And here we have Micah prophesying of the Lord's future reign. And it says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. Verse 4, everyone, not some people, everyone will live in peace and prosperity, enjoying their own grapevines and fig trees. For there will be nothing to fear. I said, for there will be nothing to fear. The Lord of heaven's armies has made this promise. Though the nations around us follow their idols, we will follow the Lord our God forever and ever. Church, say amen. You may be seated. It's interesting to me that after the mention of fig trees, see, the, the prophet uh, Micah is prophesying of the Lord's future reign as king and priest. And what we see is that there's a promise from God that every man will be enjoying their own fig trees. And immediately following the reference of the fig tree, there's this assurance that the prophet gave us that there will be nothing to fear. It's interesting to me. It, it brings to question what must be the relationship between fear and a flourishing fig tree. To understand the significance of the fig, we have to know that the fig always signifies, it's an indicator, a barometer of the nation of Israel's, God's chosen people's will, being in times of judgment. The scripture tells us time and time again that the flourishing, that the once flourishing fig trees would be bare. But when they were under times of favor and God was pleased with his chosen people, it says that the fig trees would flourish and that every man would have his own to sit under. Because sitting under the shade of the fig tree, it signified resting under the provision and promises of God. It's why the disciple Nathaniel, when he came to the realization that Jesus was, in fact, the prophesied Messiah, Jesus complimented Nathaniel in such a way that only someone who knows you on an intimate level could compliment you. And this blew Nathaniel's mind. It caused Nathaniel to say, where did you get to know me? And Jesus replied, I saw you sitting under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathaniel replied to this revelation of the prophesied Messiah saying, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. This would be the equivalent of a stranger, someone you just met saying they saw you at a time when you were in a place where only you and God resided. He says, you are the son of God. The fig tree was, uh, in a sense, it was the original prayer closet. It was that secret place. It signified resting under the provision and promises of God. It represented intimate uh, communication between God. The fig tree, the fig leaf, and the fig, there's a direct correlation between, between the fruitfulness of God's people, their well-being, and the promises of God. And the prophet, for some reason, thought it important to position fear as an enemy of the flourishing fig. Let's talk about it. But if fear is an enemy of the harvest for figs, are there other enemies of the harvest? And God took me to Hosea 9 and 10. Hosea 9 and 10. And here we have the prophet Hosea uh, pronouncing judgment on Israel for their sin, for their worship of idols, from their turning away from God. And it says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the what? Fig tree in its first season. But they, they went to Baal and separated themselves to that shame. They became an abomination like the things they loved. Here we have the prophet telling Israel that God saw your fathers not just as figs, but as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. But it says they went to Baal. 
They worship idol gods. They exalted things above the true and living God. And what it caused it to do is cause them to separate themselves to that shame. Shame, for some reason, immediately follows the mention of the fig. See, this is why as fruit of the harvest, it's important for us to be mindful of the things that we behold. Scripture tells us that when we behold with an open face the glory of God, we too are transformed into his very image. But the truth is, is that if we're beholding other things, we too can become like those things we love. The scripture told us they became an abomination like the things that they love, the things that we consume on a daily basis, the things we call entertainment. I'm not saying that you can't enjoy them, but you have to understand that when we consume these things day in and day out, uh, the the ideologies that we've subscribed to, uh, some of us, uh, politics has become an idol. Some of us are so stricken with fear and shame because our news channel stays on anyway. So what I'm saying is, is that we have... (laughs) these things that we've positioned and placed in our lives that we're consuming on a daily basis more than the word and the promises of God. We have to be mindful of what we behold because what we behold, we become. The counsel that we keep, and I hear somebody in their mind saying, but they're, but they're all I know, they're who, they're who all I know, they're, those are my people, but, but it's all I know, that environment, it's what I grew up in, it's, it's, but see, the problem is, is that familiarity may provide us comfort for a season, for a moment, but it'll never take us to new places. Some of us are stuck and bound in our current situations, not because we're bad people, not because, uh, not because we uh, don't, God doesn't love us, but because we refuse to, to, to reject the nostalgia and the comfort of prior seasons. It's important to understand that familiarity may provide comfort, but it will never take you to new places. And I'm not saying this for the purpose of becoming more religious. I know that's like a cuss word in church these days. You got to be careful. Religion. But the truth is, I'm not saying this for just to simply be more religious. Is uh, religious. I'm saying this because as fruit of the harvest, the transformation, the growth, uh, 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 the, all the things that are happening inside of our lives, we have to not only provide for protect. It's important to understand that figs require cultivation and rotting fruit will only attract more devastation. One thing that I've learned with my son having uh, the garden in the backyard is if he's not on top of picking the fruit on time, they'll begin to rot. And when fruit begins to rot, all it does is attract more enemies of the harvest. And so I have to get on to my son because if he's not staying on top of the fruit, if he's not picking it at the right time, it'll begin to rot. And that rotting process just attracts more devastation. And what it does, it puts the rest of the garden at jeopardy. It's important to understand. Figs require cultivation. And rotting fruit only attracts more devastation. So here the the prophets have positioned fear and shame immediately following the mention of the fig, the fig leaf, or the fig tree. And I'm stubborn because when God gives me what I ask for, I tend to always follow up with, but is there a scripture that shows us fear and shame and the fig tree, fig leaf, or figs all together? And God is faithful, church, because Genesis 3 Verses 7 through 10, the fall of man, such a significant moment in our history. Mankind has fallen. Genesis 3, verses 7 through 10, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked and sewed fig leaves together. Y'all, sewed what? Fig leaves together together and made themselves covering. I got to go back. I got to be obedient. It said, then the eyes of both of them were open. We need to be careful what we call woke. (laughs) Because, see, Adam and Eve thought that partaking of the fruit of the knowledge and good and evil would open their eyes. But what they didn't see was a veil that was placed over as a result. And the scripture says that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The Garden of Eden was not in Texas. 
It says, it says he was walking, not at night, but at day, and it was cool. And Adam said, now Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. It mentions the fig leaf, but the place where they hid themselves from God, where they separated themselves to, those trees weren't even worth mentioning. It said, then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Adam, where are you? When God asks a question he knows the answer to, the answer isn't for God. He said, Adam, where, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. I had no idea that the first season of Naked and Afraid was in Genesis chapter 3. Yo, there's truly nothing new under the sun. Here, Adam and Eve were naked and afraid. And we see fear, but not just fear, shame. Mentioned in the scripture alongside the reference of the fig, the fig tree, or the fig leaves. It became clear at this point, God, fear and shame are juxtaposed to the flourishing fig tree. In fact, it's interesting that the fig tree is the only tree specifically mentioned by name in the Garden of Eden. We know there was a tree of life, but we don't know exactly the type of tree that was. We know there was a tree of knowledge and good and evil. Uh, we know that Adam hid himself behind some trees, but we don't know what type of trees those were. But the scripture said that he sowed fig leaves together. And following the fall, what did Adam do? Full of fear, full of shame, he sowed fig leaves together to cover himself. Fear and shame caused Adam to misuse and repurpose something that God already made perfect. See, that's what, that's what we see in society today, right? The misuse, the repurposing of things that God had already made perfect. Essentially, Adam felt the need in this moment to begin making provisions for himself. Rather than resting under the provisions of God, in this moment, the very thing he was meant to sit under was now reduced to just underwear. Like at this point, it's just covering Adam and Eve. And it's amazing, the misuse, the repurposing, the illogical redefining of things that God has already established as perfect. That is just like society, but I can't just call out society because church, if we're honest, too many of us subscribe to fear and shame. Shame of our faith. When we enter into these different spaces, whether it's work, whether it's the grocery store, whether it's around family, whether it's around some of your friends who may not believe what you believe, sometimes we allow the shame of our own faith to keep us quiet when we should speak. Some of us have subscribed to the same fear, and I'm not condemning anyone because I, too, have experienced the economic stresses, inflation, all the demand, uh, 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 jobs, uh, asking you to do the job of three or four people. Some people right now are losing their jobs. It's easy to become a victim of fear and forget the provision, the promises of God. And what happens is because we've subscribed to some of the same fear and shame, well, we have been robbed of the boldness and the confidence that we've been called to walk in as saints. See, fear, fear will drive you to begin making provisions for yourselves rather than relying on the provisions and the promises for God's chosen people. Fear, fear will make you hateful. I've experienced it. Fear, part of the reason we experience so many issues in America with uh, 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 racism and prejudice, it's not the result of just hate, it's really the result of fear. Because some group has been told they need to fear another group. See, fear will make you do some things, it'll make you hateful, but fear will also, fear will also make you unforgiving. Some of us cannot move forward in relationships with people because we've been hurt. And because we've experienced pain, because um, we feel it, we've had the feeling of being forsaken, because people have broken our hearts, we can't find it in ourselves to forgive fear. Fear will make you stagnant. Fear will paralyze you from being able to progress, to move, to enter into new spaces. Fear will drive you to anxiety. And, and, and you'll have your mind plagued by some of the most irrational fears. I'm not talking uh, uh, from any other perspective than experience. Fear will drive you anxious and shame. Lord, have mercy. I don't think our parents understood the weight of shame when they would look you in your eyes and tell you, shame on you. Be careful.
careful what you pronounce over your children. Shame, shame is weighty. Shame will make you do some things. Shame will leave you depressed. It'll cause you to turn inwardly rather than upwardly. Shame will cause you to isolate. It's why God had to say, Adam, where are you? Because what shame caused Adam to self-imprison himself when God never told him he was naked. Who told you you were naked? Adam, where are you? Fear and shame, they're they're enemies of the harvest, of the promise, of the provisions of God for his chosen people. And to become like a fig. I need y'all with me, church. To become like a fig. We talked about the sacrifice that was required. And see, I'm a grace preacher. I love talking about the mercy and the love and the grace of God because it's only by grace and through faith that we have salvation. But, But I could leave here today with a clear conscience, only having pointed you to the perfect sacrifice, which is a perfect sacrifice, good once for all time. I could leave here with a clear conscience telling you the sacrifice for sin was uh, complete and done, that the finished work is complete and that there's no more sacrifices needed because the scripture does tell us, tells us that where there's a perfect sacrifice, no other sacrifices are needed. And although there's no need for another sacrifice for sin, the truth, the truth in me has to tell you that we can only become like figs. We can only become like the flourishing fig tree. We can only become a house of figs when we sacrifice the comfort of prior seasons. See, the problem is, is that for many of us, we're clinging to nostalgia, the way things used to be. We don't talk about the discomfort of grace. See, we, we've made grace uh, to, we've reduced it to just being an ultra plush sleep number mattress that will catch you when you fall. And although it will catch you, amen, when you fall, the truth is, is that any doctor, any chiropractor will tell you that when there's misalignment, when things aren't aligned properly, a plush mattress won't help you. It's a firm mattress that will help things get back into line. See, we don't talk about the discomfort of grace. We don't talk about the discomfort of receiving by grace. Because there's nothing more comfortable than having what you feel you deserve. Because if I feel I've earned this, I have the power and the ability to sustain it. But receiving by grace, it prevents this, this interesting dichotomy. It, it presents this, this weird feeling of if I'm receiving that which I don't deserve, if I'm receiving that which I can't sustain, how Will it be maintained, the discomfort of grace? See, that's why we live by grace through faith. It's a spirit-led life. Somebody said, well, that sounds good, but what does that actually look like? A pastor once told me, if you want to know what God is doing in the supernatural, what he's looking to establish in the supernatural, look at what the enemy's doing in the natural. It's always the opposite. So if we're being plagued with this fear of lack, What God is seeking to establish is a generous church. Not just a church that does good things, but a church that understands that generosity is as much a part of our identity, that generosity is something we've inherited as the result of being the righteousness of God in Christ. A few times, a few months ago, when I was here, we talked about the word tzedakah. Tzedakah is the Hebrew word for generosity and the Hebrew word for righteousness. Somebody said, give me an example. Aram, as he stood in the presence of Melchizedek, whose name means king of righteousness. Remember what I said, what we behold, we become. Abraham stood in the presence of the king of righteousness. He received communion, bread, and wine, and something was imparted. His natural response was to operate in generosity because generosity is as much part of our identity as righteousness If we're experiencing a fear of lack, that fear of lack is only overcome through us becoming the generosity of God, not just giving money, giving your time, giving your resources, amen, saying yes when you really wanted to say no, not just when it's convenient, but when it's inconvenient, when it's going to cost you something, the fear of shame. Some of us may be dealing with the fear of shame, maybe one, because our lives don't look the way that we wanted it to look. Maybe we're continuing to struggle with some things that continue to to, to weight us down, to hold us down. Some of us are not where we thought we would be. Some of us just fear, have this fear of shame that, if I'm being honest, the only solution for fear of shame is to be in an environment like Inspired to Live, to surround yourself with the believers, to, to make a relationship with people who you feel comfortable sharing in weakness. 
See, we all like to post the highlights, but do you have a brother or do you have a sister you can go to to say, hey, I'm struggling with addiction. I, I, I can't seem to shake this hold that this man or this woman has on me. I've tried, but I can't. We have to cultivate an environment where the harvest can flourish, and it can only be do so when we carry the weight. See, the thing about gardens is sometimes, sometimes the weight of the produce, the weight of the harvest will bear down. It has to be held up, lifted up by other branches or by, by some type of metal apparatus. There's some holding up that has to take place in order for things to flourish. We have to be in an environment where we can intercede on one another's behalf, where you don't fear, fear shame, where you can share in weakness. It's one of the reasons why Paul always encouraged the early church to confess your sins one to another for the edification, for the building up. We were not created to suffer in silence, but to intercede for one another. And some of us might be dealing with the fear of inadequacy. I'm not smart enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not uh, good looking enough. Uh, the fear of inadequacy that I can't do it. I'm not smart enough. These things, these things can only be overcome by us rejecting the known and entering and stepping out into the unknown. Launching out into the deep as God gets ready to take ITL to new spaces and new places in the months to come and the years to come. What's going to be required of you more than anything is a willingness to sacrifice comforts of prior seasons, to be willing to sacrifice nostalgia and the things that were known to enter into the unknown. Fear and shame have no place in a house of figs. Because if fear and shame have their way, a dying a starving, a thirsty, a desperate world will never get to experience true and perfect love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This season, God is establishing his house as a house of figs. Yes, for the fulfillment of your own personal joy and peace, but more importantly, so that we're a church, that we're a body of believers that's fit for the consumption of a dying and starving world, looking for answers, looking to be replenished. This is why God is making us a fruitful harvest to provide nourishment, hope, faith to the lost, to the famine, and for dry bones to come alive. Amen. And I'm getting ready to close. See, another, another amazing fact that I learned about figs because the problem that I had, I talked to God like this, is, God, this is great, but every produce, every fruit, every vegetable, it has a season of harvest, but what do you do when the season of harvest is over? And he said, don't worry about the end of the harvest, because although harvest for figs is early summer through the fall, the Bible gives us example after example of how the figs that were obtained during harvest were stored and used to make fig cakes that people would enjoy in the seasons to come. See, the Bible mentioned on more than one occasion the significance of not just the fig, the fig leaf, and the fig tree, but also the fig cake. In fact, the prophet Isaiah placed the cake of figs on the wounds of a dying king Hezekiah, and the scripture tells us he was immediately healed. The sacrifices, the sacrifices of prior comforts, the things that we're willing to lay aside, die to, so that immature fruit can become mature fruit. Those will be the very areas that will serve us in the seasons to come. See, in some instances, the fig cake was even used uh, in trade because of its value. So I would essentially be able to trade a fig cake for some other good because fig cakes had value. In other instances, the fig cake was actually given to replenish people who came in from uh, starving or thirsty environments. It says they would give them the fig cake as a result to essentially replenish them. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt that this season, those sacrifices, those fruits, that are cultivated in this season are going to be enjoyed, experienced, and they'll be the currency of inspired to live in the seasons to come. Because this is only the beginning, church. Only the beginning. So if you could, do me a favor one last time. Look to your neighbor and say, this house is a house of figs. Can you imagine inspired to live being an indicator, a barometer of God's well being. If fear and shame have their way, none of us.
us will be fit for consumption to a dying and desperate world. This is an opportunity. See, some of us, altar calls are, are, are touchy subjects because we're like, well, I'm saved. I gave my life to Jesus. You know, I got some things I'm, he's, he's working through me, but I'm, I'm strong. But see, this is also a place to lay at his feet. It's a place to pour out. If there's some things that have been plaguing your mind, if there's fear, if there's shame, if there's anything that tries to exalt itself above the name of Jesus, if there's anything that wants to prevent you from being an indicator of well-being, this, this is the time to lay it down at the feet of Jesus. We don't want to be robbed of the boldness and confidence we've been called to walk in. That's why the scripture says that we can boldly approach the throne of grace, knowing that in times of need we'll find grace and mercy. There's a confidence that we've been called to walk in. And God is not only looking to redeem us from sin, but also a consciousness of sin. That's why the scripture says that his, that his blood was sprinkled on our guilty conscience. He wants to redeem you from a life of sin, but also the consciousness of your own inadequacy. That voice that tells you you'll never be good enough. This is a house of figs. Prayer team, if you want to come forward. If there's anyone in the house, if there's anyone watching online, if there's anyone that says, I want to partake of this covenant, this new covenant established in and around the perfect sacrifice. I want us to close our eyes in faith in case there's one who may not have the courage to come up to the altar. And I want us to say, Father God, Forgive me for my sin. I thank you that you sent your son to die, not only for my sin, but for my shame. And I thank you that I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Heal me from every fear, every shame, every sickness, everything that tries to exalt itself above you. And I proclaim that just as you died for my sin, that after three days, you resurrected with all power in your hands. And I too can experience resurrection life as the result. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. You are my King. And you are my peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.